you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure and a privilege and an honor to be here. I travel a lot, and this is one of the best conferences in which it has been my pleasure and privilege to participate. And so I am honored to be included. I want to thank the organizers for putting together such a well done conference. And I want to thank the translators uh, for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, and I want to thank you for creating the opportunity to try to share what I will share with you. Uh, because you create not only the opportunity, you create space, you create environment, you give permission, and by your attention, you enable us to hope to share some of what we know. So thank you to all the speakers as well uh, on, on whose shoulders I, I stand. I want to use Travis uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, the keynoter just a little bit uh, as places to begin. Now, what Travis talked about a lot in outlining the entire network were the sources of truth. Uh, it ought to be clear now, if you are paying attention to the networks, that they are images or symbols, they are metaphors for all of life and how we participate in all of our uh, activities. And therefore, almost everything that Travis just said could apply to the larger scale of what I'm going to discuss, which is the same thing. What are the sources of truth at the level of society that we know? How do we know they are true? How reliable is the data which is filtered through the media into the mind of society? And how easy is it to corrupt that data? And how easy, how easy is it to distort the data? And how certain and confident are you, as he said, uh, about, not about logs, but about the narratives which are in your minds about the truth of the society in which you live, that it is telling you the truth? Have you been deceived in any significant way, a, a meaningful way, and an important way in how you construct your image or understanding of what's real. It applies to the work you do because the networks which you maintain and enable and their vulnerabilities are the means by which a new kind of humanity has been building its structure of information and communication and beyond that it's very lifeblood. So what Travis called data retention we call on the larger societal scale history. History. And how accurate is the history which we believe we understand because the narrative we tell about our history is how we determine our very identity. And our identity is our destiny. So, how do we do all this? when the network is a media-mediated filter for the images in our heads. Dr. Masuda referred to numerous movies uh, like The Terminator, or Her, or Hell, or uh, Ex Machina. Uh, this is how the mind of society is getting its information. If you think about what all of those movies say about technology, they say predominantly two things, I thought, as I listened to him. Wise man that he is. They show what we feel about technology, that either it is seductive, as in her, or it is dominating, as in the Terminator. Usually when it's seductive, as in her or ex machina, it takes the form of a woman, Usually, although Terminator changed it a little bit, when it is dominating and controlling and overpowering, it takes the form of a man. Therefore, those images that are put into our minds frame 
and determine how we think and feel about technology. Because to be seductive is to dominate in a soft way. Whereas to be the terminator is to dominate in a hard way. So those are metaphors that determine how we think. And we don't even notice that those movies that Dr. Masuda outlined or illuminated for us penetrate our defenses. I have been told that the best way to get my ideas across is to write entertainment. Because therefore you, you can't be ridiculed. Some of the things I'm going to say are open to ridicule if I said them from the platform as these are things I know. This is the truth. But when you present it as fiction, you can communicate as like mind candy, candy of the mind, to people who just take it in. And studies have shown that when you sit in a movie theater, the images and narratives you internalize, take into your brain, become indistinguishable from things you experienced or things you imagined. They become your very memories. And therefore, those who in the aggregate, in the big picture, determine the images in your brain will determine ultimately how you think of yourselves, therefore, how you hold yourself as a possibility for meaningful action. So, this is not trivial. I use the image of a Mobius strip to indicate this perilous journey we are all on in the 21st century. A Mobius strip is a geometrical figure which looks as if it has two sides. And so you launch yourself down one side of the strip and discover yourself on a single side that loops you back to the beginning again. That is the way the information loop in society works. And that's what I hope to illuminate. It will get complicated. E.B. White is an American humorist, or was, when he was alive. And he said, it is no wonder how complicated things get, what with one thing leading to another. And that's exactly what we have to try to untangle. So, where did I get the idea that fiction is the only way you can tell the truth? I'm going to start, I'm going to show you two of the books I've written as examples. This is called Mind Games. It is a collection of short stories. And after writing about technology in a different collection called Islands in the Clickstream, why did I turn back to fiction? Well, after 9-11, after the attack on New York and Washington, uh, things changed in America. It was a contextual shift of a radical nature. And the instructions that went from the White House under George Bush to the intelligence community changed and authorized and ordered a different way of doing things. Some of the people at for example, the National Security Agency, the NSA, became very concerned about the new executive orders that were defining their job for them going forward after 9-11. They were concerned because they were older, and they had always been taught that there were certain things in intelligence gathering that you did not do. They were illegal, or they were unconstitutional. And now the new orders told them that is exactly what we are going to do. So some of them, a few friends of mine who worked at that agency, invited me to help facilitate a group discussion which went on over several years to try to understand how to think about ethics how to think about the right thing to do in light of the fact that the previous standards or ideals we had used were no longer being applied. And in the course of these discussions, which I would love to say were very fruitful, but they were not, they wound up on a piece of paper in the agency for a while. 
Uh, in the course of these discussions, a deputy director of Homeland Defense for NSA said to me quite honestly, Richard, you can't ever discuss the things we talk about in this group. It was sensitive but unclassified, but you can't discuss it. And then he smiled and said, the only way you can tell the truth now is through fiction. The result was 35 short stories that I've published, and I just recently had a new novel come out called Foam that I'll refer to later. And among those 35 stories are 19 that were collected in this book, Mind Games, which are stories of professional intelligence and hackers and deep states of consciousness and encounters with other civilizations, not necessarily of this earth. Four kinds of reality, which most people do not experience, uh, I call them not consensual. The consensual reality is the group reality that people believe in. Uh, that's the subject of these stories. And I could say things in them that, like I just said, I could not otherwise say. Here's a page from the first story. What I'm showing you is what it looked like on a tweet on Twitter that I was fascinated to see. There's the three paragraphs from the story, and then up there is a link to the revelations that were then new from Edward Snowden. What the person tweeting them had noticed is that all of the things that I said in that story were things that Snowden was then saying. It is in the words of a dying intelligence professional who is attempting to tell the American people or the world, this is what we do. And if you go down the list, what I was doing was really putting together different things I knew with different things I suspected. But a friend at NSA called up when he read the story and he was laughing. He said, 95% of your story is true, but you have to know which 95% in order to understand it. Well, once Snowden proclaimed all of the things he proclaimed, people could begin to see that even though my story was published in 2006 and Snowden was a number of years later, that we were talking about the same reality. But I could say it in fiction, and that allows me to travel anywhere in the world that I want to go, whereas Edward Snowden did it a different way, and he is stuck in an apartment in Moscow for a long time to come. <coughs> Excuse me. So, a professor in America named Timothy Malley wrote about this in a book called The Covert Sphere, because what he noticed is that since World War II, things had so changed in America about the sources of our ideas about the world, that we were relying on entertainment, on movies, on books, on stories, on television programs, to provide public knowledge of our secret affairs. And when we did that, he said, the contradictions of empire were, I don't know how this will translate, normalized to invisibility normalized to invisibility. The contradictions of the empire the United States has built since World War II became invisible because through the means of entertainment, stories, movies, books, TV programs, they became the normal reality in which people believed. So, this suggests a couple of things. One, that which we believe as truth is not always the truth. In fact, it is often seldom the truth. Remember what Travis said. What are the sources of truth? What are the nodes through which the information and data flows that you then monitor, process, and integrate in order to articulate a synthesis or big-picture understanding of what's real? 
It is no different than what the network itself, the tools and technologies of the network itself, enable you to do. But it goes further than that because the only way to tell the truth is in fiction, because it provides plausible deniability to writers of fiction, which is very similar to the permission the state gave to itself as a way to operate after World War II. So, the Cold War has been a war fought through symbols, through words, through propaganda, and once a nuclear exchange became literally unthinkable to both the Soviet Union and the United States, those words and the media were both used to create a large scenario. The technical term is an event scene, a narrative that is believed in the mind of society, which called itself the free world, and it was used to disguise those covert operations, which became a hallmark of the real war, which in America we continue to fight. Now, I want to be very clear that I do not understand nor pretend to understand how, here in Japan, the reality I'm describing is said, articulated, or framed. My point of reference is the United States, in which I have always lived, although I've lived abroad several times. I'm talking about the American experience. We have a military presence in over 150 countries. I am not saying that's bad, I'm saying it is so. It is what's real. That's a lot of presence, and we use the media to disguise the fact of how we have operated in the world since World War II. During World War II, the intelligence apparatus, which we began for the first time in our history, was the OSS. But after World War II, it became the CIA. And the intelligence community, which has become the core, the furnace, the heart of the national security state, began to evolve. So the dynamics created by the Cold War and how it was waged have persisted through what we called the war on drugs when it looked like the Cold War was over, and now the war on terrorism. I imagine it will persist in all the wars which come along, and it was accelerated by the technology or IT revolution because that became the means of communication and information dissemination for everyone. So how did it happen? It began under President Eisenhower. He was the invisible guiding hand behind information warfare in all of its forms. And after 9-11, part of the concern of my friends was that the top secret world, which the government had created in response to the terror attacks, has become so large, so unwieldy, and so secretive that no one knows how much money it costs, how many people it employs, or how many programs exist within it, nor how many agencies actually do the same work. We know of 16 intelligence agencies that are public and can be defined and named. You know some of them, the DIA, the CIA, the NSA, uh, Department of Treasury, and so on. Uh, but we don't know all of them. We do know that 850,000 people, which is one and a half times as many people as live in Washington, D.C., hold top secret security clearances. Now, in 1947, the National Security Act in the USA created the CIA, and it enabled for the first time covert action and covert psychological operations as a way of fighting the Cold War. George Kennan was the name of the man who helped frame this way of understanding, and he said it had to be done in such a way that the U.S. could publicly disclaim any responsibility for them. Eisenhower embraced this. The first instances of it were the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran and his replacement with the Shah. 
and then the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala, both of whom were democratically elected leaders of their respective countries, but who practiced policies that the powers of the United States came to conclude uh, were inimical or against what the United States wanted. Thus began a means of suspending democracy in order to preserve democracy. It is very much like the statement that was made during the Vietnam War, we had to destroy the village to save it. We had to develop covert means of disseminating stories, false, half true, somewhat true. The best propaganda always puts lies and half-truths together with truths because they become a tangle which, because people know some of it is true, people come to believe that all of it is true. And so the CIA appointed itself a ministry of culture. What I am saying is not controversial. It's simply historical fact. We had to combat the ministry of culture in the Soviet Union but we had no formal or official structure like that, so the CIA covertly appointed itself a means of doing that. In the 1950s and the 1960s, the CIA was the largest sponsor of literature and art in the United States of America, and through the Congress of Cultural Freedom, employed untold numbers of journalists, editors, publishers, novelists, PR officers. Here, for example, is Animal Farm. Animal Farm was a book written by George Orwell, but what this points to is the movie, the animated movie, anime, of Animal Farm. Uh, it was created by the CIA. The CIA also published over 1,000 books covertly during that time and established and supported journalistic enterprises, magazines, and important intellectual journals all over the world, so that the CIA was the primary sponsor of the leading intellectual periodicals which people read during the 1950s and 1960s, and also covertly behind the creation of movies. The problem, of course, is that when it is covert, it undermines the very proclamation which a film like Animal Farm is trying to make. Uh, so, George Kennan, to whom I referred, said, they have fought us, they being the Soviet Union, with unreality, with irrationalism. Can we combat unreality successfully, he asked, with rationalism and truth? The answer, obviously, was no. Let me give you a primary example. In the 1950s, Americans became very frightened of brainwashing. Prisoners, which were held by the Chinese, were inverting their behavior, turning it completely on end, and people became convinced that there were secret methods of mind control that were being used by the Soviets and the Chinese after the Communist Revolution in order to do this terrible thing. A major article appeared written by a journalist named Edward Hunter. It invented the word and the concept of brainwashing. Uh, I don't know what the Japanese term for it is, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. What was revealed was that Edward Hunter wasn't really or just a journalist. He was an operative of the CIA. And the reason he wrote the article about brainwashing was one of their efforts to increase funding for the military during the early years of the Cold War. In other words, he made it up. He invented brainwashing in the same way that people invent anything to make people frightened, because when people are frightened 
They will behave in predictable ways, and they are vulnerable to more facile, to easier uh, manipulation. So the concept of brainwashing began uh, way back then in an article written by a secret agent of the CIA as if it was journalism. In other words, it was untruth, presented as truth, read and believed as truth. Fiction was the means. There was a panic about brainwashing during the Korean War. In response to which, the Americans, we ourselves, experimented on North Korean prisoners in order to discover, for defensive purposes, uh, how this was done. So, In Search of the Manchurian Candidate is a history of the CIA and mind control, the secret history of behavioral sciences. Meanwhile, inside the agencies, they worked very hard to discover the real brainwashing used by the communists because even within the agency itself, because not everyone knows the source of the concept and that article was a CIA agent because that would ruin it. Even within the agency, those without a need to know don't know and therefore took their own fiction as reality and began working very hard through programs that have names that are innocent, like Bluebird, Artichoke, MKUltra, in which we experimented with drugs and other techniques, deprivation, sensory deprivation, brain surgery, some pretty, pretty serious things. Uh, we did this primarily through a psychiatric institute in Montreal, Canada, and the CIA chose to do it in Montreal in order to have plausible deniability that they had anything to do with it. So they did work on finding the techniques of brainwashing, even though it was true that the Russians and the Chinese had not used any new technique. They used the same old, brutal techniques that were correct in each case for each culture. The Chinese did it the Chinese way, and the Russians did it the Russian way, but neither of them did it in a new way. Now, then the Manchurian candidate became such a, a frightening thing, uh, it was turned into a book. Uh, it was turned into a book be which became very, very popular, and then it was turned into a movie. Here in Japan, the first movie with Frank Sinatra, the better movie, was called Assassin Without a Shadow, and then the later remake of it with Denzel Washington was called The Crisis of America. But in America, they were both called The Manchurian Candidate. I'll get to that one in a minute. So they became movies which people saw and believed, even though they were fictional narratives, believed that they depicted something that was really taking place. The search for what did not exist nevertheless led to a belief in brainwashing so deep that when the war on terror began and the Americans decided that they would use torture as part of their interrogation techniques, they needed a manual to tell practitioners how to do it. It's called the Kubark Manual. Kubark Manual. It was written by someone who was using the fictional techniques which were described in the whole narrative of the Manchurian Candidate and how that notion of brainwashing evolved. And so the Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation Manual was used to simulate brainwashing on Americans in order to teach them how to withstand brainwashing techniques when they were applied to them. Do you see why a Mobius strip is the appropriate metaphor for what we're describing? It began as a covert article written about something that did not exist, 
which came to be believed and promulgated through fiction and movies so deeply that when, after 9-11, we wanted to do it ourselves, we used the fiction we had created in order to develop a manual of technique. It also became a TV series called The Unit. In episode eight of this TV program, the team participates in a, what we call a SEER, S-E-R-E, training drill, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape, in which they were treated as prisoners of war, and the drill pushed them to their mental and physical limits. It was based on the Kubark manual that was based on the original fiction. So, you get the idea of where I'm going. Here is a submarine. It's K-129. It was a Soviet submarine. It went down in the Pacific. It broke in half and lay on the bottom of the ocean. And the Soviets could not locate it, but the Americans did. And we wanted to retrieve it because we wanted to know what technology it was using and to reverse engineer whatever techniques they were using for their own nuclear submarines and to develop appropriate attack and defense protocols. Now, the interesting thing is we created a project called Project Azorian. Uh, it was also called the Glomer Explorer, in which the CIA created a, what we call a proprietary, a fictional entity to do deep sea exploration and mining. Now, the company was real. The purpose for which it was created was not. The real purpose was to retrieve the submarine. But in the meantime, it did important work in mining. It was led by a man named Howard Hughes. And they even set up competing organizations in order to spur each other on in order to get them to where they wanted to be able to do, to what they wanted to be able to do, which was retrieve the Soviet, the Soviet submarine. Um, because elements of the national security state were committed to the protection of these strategic fictions and deceptions, the mind of society becomes confused about what is real. We call it postmodern or hyper real, and it is the world which the national security state globally has created for us that makes it very difficult to determine for ourselves what is really happening. It is what we call a wilderness of mirrors. And the way, for example, the procedures were executed for this uh, were people met in secret in underground bunkers. I've had people who were there describe to me the nature of the deep, extensive uh, creation of under, underground facilities. They would converge on the facility, have meetings, no notes or records were kept, and then when they dispersed, the meeting never happened. It never took place. In other words, they turned our history into what someone called a symphony, played in a hall with many dead spaces in which you could hear in one place but not in another. And therefore, the metaphor of what Travis just described so beautifully uh, is completely appropriate because all of the nodes in the network through which information flows must be integrated authentically and really, and the information must not be distorted or altered in the process. But that's exactly the situation in which I, we find ourselves, in a wilderness of mirrors. I sat in the rain in the city of Chicago with a friend from NSA telling him what I thought I had discovered about a particular subject. And he said, you're wandering in the wilderness now. You know enough about what is put out there to know it isn't true. But you might not know yet all of the pieces that make up the truth. Because in fact, Project Azorian, like so many of our covert operations, had multiple levels of deception applied to it so that each person encountering it would receive an explanation of what was happening that was 
that made sense to them, that was congruent with their frame of reality. It was what they believed already, just added to a little more at each level. And according to a friend at CIA who participated in that, each level was kind of true. In other words, each level was partially true, but not the whole truth. And you don't always get the whole truth. A friend at NSA said that he just found out that a project in which he participated in the 1980s, while the purpose for which it was done was accurate, it wasn't the real purpose because it was used as cover for some other covert operation that none of the people working on it knew. An important point is that only seven people knew the real purpose of Project Zorian or the Glomer uh, Explorer project to retrieve that Soviet submarine. The president did not know. Why did the president not know? Because he did not need to know. And the people who control information make the decisions about who it is essential to communicate the truth to, and the president is often not in the loop because he didn't need to know what was going on until the project was over. Well, you see the problem. This information creates confusion for us. Uh, let me give you another example. Here is Alexander Haig. He was Secretary of State. And he became very alarmed when he read a book by an author named Claire Sterling called The Terror Network during the Cold War. In the book, she claimed that, all, this is a quote, all major terrorist groups operating in the world were controlled by the Soviet Union. The book was warmly endorsed by Alexander Haig. He held a press conference to announce his concern and alarm as Secretary of State to discover this to be true and instructed a man named Colby, uh, Casey, William Casey, who was then head of the CIA, to get to the bottom of it and investigate. Uh, Casey did, and he presented his thesis to the Senate and he assigned top CIA terrorist analysts and Soviet experts to prepare a special national intelligence estimate based on Sterling's book. But this is what they discovered. The book was based originally on reports in an Italian newspaper that was a proprietary or asset of the CIA. And the report that all terror was controlled by the Soviet Union was a fiction created by the CIA and promulgated through the newspaper, which then became a book, which then came to the attention of someone who did not have a need to know that it was being placed covertly in the newspaper by the CIA in the first place, who cried out in alarm that something must be done. And that's why Casey finally had to tell him don't worry about it. It's not true. We made it up. This is called, in the intelligence community, blowback. Blowback means things which you create out there as events or narratives come home to haunt you. And one of the consequences of a global dissemination of information and communication that we have now built with new technologies is that it is impossible to disseminate covert narratives to an enemy, real or imagined, without simultaneously deceiving one's own people. Because the information world is global. It is that Mobius strip once again. It looks like it's going one place, but it comes back. And therefore, the very people who constitute the um, foundation of a democracy uh, experience themselves treated as if they are an enemy as well because they too become victims of what is promulgated through these narratives. Uh, this confuses us. I'm going to give you another example. Uh, this is another book which I have been privileged to help create and 
I know if you say the word UFO, people think it's a ridiculous concept. Uh, this book is called UFOs and Government, a Historical Inquiry. This is a work of inquiry in which a team of us spent five years using the documents we had gotten from FOIA, the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, uh, in order to use only government documents and other primary sources. There are nearly 1,000 footnotes in this book which document how the government responded to the phenomena we call UFOs from the 1940s to the 1980s. The book in America, and even in some other countries, is in over 65 university libraries because it's the only book of its kind that is recommended as the gold standard, the, the very best you can do in a historical analysis of how the government responded. And one of the things the government did in 1953, when they knew that the phenomena was real, because there was an event over Washington, D.C. that could not be denied. So many planes were launched from air bases around Washington. So many people saw the lights maneuvering in the sky. The fighters pursued them. So many of them were on radar. And there were headlines all over the country. So the CIA and the Air Force formed a committee called the Robertson Panel and came up with two action recommendations. The danger was not the phenomena. The way they define danger or dangerous military threat is not how strong is it or how superior is it, but does it pose by its action a real and present threat to the United States of America? They were only concerned about national security. They weren't concerned about the science of it, not on that level. And they concluded that it did not pose a threat to the United States because it was not acting like an attacker or an invader. The real threat, they concluded, came from people believing in UFOs. And they began a program which is extant, still in operation, to debunk people who made reports, to downplay, to push down the reports that people were making. They didn't need people to tell them they had seen things or what had happened. They knew that. They had many trained observers who confirmed it within the military and the intelligence world. And at the same time, they said they would begin a covert program to learn everything they could possibly learn about the technologies that confronted us from this phenomena. Notice I'm being very careful not to pretend that I know what it is or how it operates. All we could document is how the government over 50 years behaved and tell that story in its own words. But what we find are two different narratives. One for consumption by the public, one for the reality of research and reverse engineering, if possible, that was done inside. A friend who works in deception uh, said to me, there are three legs of the stool of deception. Illusion, misdirection, and ridicule. Illusion means we create fictions which people believe because they are repeated and disseminated through authoritative, legitimate sources and voices. Remember, I referred to the use by the CIA of the media. When Carl Bernstein wrote an article in the Rolling Stone magazine in 1978, he identified between two and 300 journalists who were wholly owned assets of the CIA. In addition, the CIA had contracts with the New York Times, Time Life, the Washington Post, and other of major media in order to be sure that the stories were promulgated and disseminated in a way that suited their ultimate purpose. Create illusions. Second, use sleight of hand or misdirection, like a magician. 
In other words, if something is so obviously happening that people can see it, you can hide it in plain daylight by making them look over here. It will still be there, but they will look somewhere else. And the use of sensation and distraction and other techniques uh, are legion. I could do a whole, well, I do a whole talk on that. The third one is ridicule. Illusion, misdirection, and ridicule. Ridicule is the important destruction of the credibility of another person, not because of what they are saying, but by attacking their character. And if you go around the truths that they are promulgating or saying and diminish their respectability, you may destroy their reputation, you may destroy their career, uh, but you render them ineffective as a teller of truth. Back to what Travis said. What are your sources of truth? Do you investigate them in detail and in depth? Where do the images and ideas that fill the mind of society derive? Where do they come from? So, uh, you're with me, right? Let's get past him. And uh, I just described that. I'm just going to give you this quote from Alan Hynek. He was an astronomer who worked with the uh, Air Force as a consultant on the subject of UFOs. And he made this statement, which I'm using simply to support my general thesis. The public was, in fact, he said, placed in the role of the enemy against whom counterespionage tactics must be employed. From my personal experience, I frequently felt that those in charge considered people who reported UFOs or even took a serious interest in them and just wanted information about them to be enemies. This has been successfully accomplished through media and above all through the use of ridicule. So that if I say to someone, I want to talk to you about UFOs, they laugh, uh, little green men, crazy stuff, he's wacko. Um, I do a whole talk on that, on this book, uh, simply because it's an important reality and phenomena of the 20th century, and it has been so successfully managed and manipulated as to render it literally ridiculous. So where do we go then to learn the truth? Well, let's look at this guy, Jack Bauer. Jack Bauer was the hero of a TV series called 24. When he was interrogating a terrorist, I believe the scenario was that he needed the information quickly and he shot him in the kneecap or otherwise abused him uh, in order to get the information. I can tell you that that has never happened the number of instances in which there is that ticking bomb that you must diffuse at once are zero. And therefore the justification for torturous interrogation, which so alarmed some of my friends, as well as the surveillance and intrusion into all lives in America, as well as in the world, because you couldn't distinguish the enemy from the people when the boundaries disappeared as a result of the technologies we have been discussing. So, Jack Bauer, this is the Supreme Court judge named Scalia, who cited Jack Bauer uh, and 24 as relevant for constitutional legal business. This is a quote from the Supreme Court Justice. Jack Bauer saved Los Angeles. He saved hundreds of thousands of lives, said Just Justice Scalia. Then, recalling season two, when the agent's rough interrogation saved California from a terrorist nuke, the Supreme Court judge etched a line in the sand. Are you going to convict Jack Bauer? He challenged fellow judges. 
Are you going to say that the criminal law is against him just because it's written that way? That you have a right to a jury trial? Is any jury going to convict Jack Bauer? I don't think so. And he concluded, the question is really whether we believe in these absolutes and ought we believe in these absolutes, to which a commentator could only say, Earth to Justice Scalia. Jack Bauer does not exist. He's a fictional character in a television show, and therefore a narrative which someone created that is fictional as justification for torture cannot be entered into a court of law, and it is scandalous for a Supreme Court justice to suggest that it can. Do you see now what I meant by normalized into invisibility? When those scenarios are so attractive that they enter the mind of society so successfully, it becomes the norm for people to believe that it is true and it is right. So, a friend of mine named Bill Scott was very concerned about certain aspects of satellite warfare. And he tried to give speeches on the subject. And people, well, they ridiculed some of what he said because they said he was exaggerating. So he wrote a book called Space Wars. And he was told by a Hollywood director, as I said, that that was the way to do it. Because when you say the stories of intelligence professionals, and hackers in mind games are fiction, then it goes down like this. But if you stand up and say, let me tell you about UFOs, or let me tell you about what we're doing in the covert world, a problem is, of course, that it has impact on us. Before it was known in the public through the New York Times <clears throat> about what we were doing that we call torture, I was talking to people who were tortured, and I was talking to people who did the torturing. And I wanted to enlist the medical establishment of the AMA and the medical college where I lived in raising ethical issues about whether this was right. Uh, so I approached them with an intention of doing that. Uh, a therapist led the ethical committee of the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I told her my concerns to encourage her to raise the issue with her colleagues. She told me to go home and read a select group of works on trauma, on what it does to someone to be traumatized. And when I next saw her, she said, do you know why I told you to read those books? I said, sure. I'm talking to people who were tortured, and I'm talking to people who were changed by having to torture. And they were in trauma, and you wanted me to understand them. And she said, can you think of any other reason? And this is what our brains do. They don't allow us to know that which we do not want to know. And I said, no, what other reason? And she said, you, to me, are showing all the symptoms of secondary trauma. In other words, knowing what I knew, holding it a secret. This is the subject of a book which I have just begun after the novel that just came out. Caused symptoms of trauma in me. After 9-11, the trauma visited upon the American public was mediated by the showing of the planes hitting the towers in New York again and again and again. America was literally traumatized by the repeated images of the attack. The attack was bad, but it was the repeated images through the media which created a climate of fear and trauma. And what I am suggesting is that our societies also show symptoms of secondary trauma, which can be easily delineated, and they include starting to think in what we call a binary way, of black and white, as good and evil, because it's promulgated from our own fears and our need to impose 
a structure on reality that we fear that we can control somehow through the narrative. It's all about control. And don't forget, not only do places like the CIA call the agent running operatives a control, it is the origin of the IT revolution. In cybernetics, and Norbert Wiener's work on cybernetics, which was about feedback loops in order to create control systems, which is exactly the work of every single person in this room. So what I'm encouraging is that we, we think about this. I'm encouraging you to think about it. I'm encouraging you, I'm looking at the time. Where is the time? It should be about the time someone gets up and says it's almost time, right? Going by the clock here. I'm encouraging you to just reflect. That's all I can do. Reflect on what I said and what it means for how you think critically about not only the, the work that you do, but about everything. Because the work that you do is a metaphor for how the world works. What are your sources of truth? How can we use critical thinking to unravel some of the tangled yarn or skeins that trap and ensnare us in these fictional narratives that we come to believe so deeply that we neglect to examine them at their core, just in the same way that Alexander Haig believed a fiction that had been promulgated. The IT revolution is instrumental in creating this state of affairs. Why? Identity is a function of boundaries, and the boundaries are down. The boundaries around nation states are penetrated by flows of information so vast and so fast that no one can stop them at the borders. The borders do not exist in the way that they existed. You showing me the time? I can see that it's uh, 6.15. Is that a suggestion that I'm about to finish? Yes, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the borders are down. The CIA was stood up as an intelligence agency to gather data about other countries. It now operates in the United States. The FBI was set up as a police, police bureau to work only in the United States. It now works internationally. In other words, the original charters, like the constitutional mandate that so upset my friends when it was overthrown by technology, means we have not yet begun to think clearly about what is the right thing to do with the world we have created? How can we maintain ourselves in it as sane and responsible citizens? OK. Usually, I bring a lot of books and sell them. I didn't bring a lot of books. It's a long way to fly with books. But I do have one copy of each. If anyone wants to see it, uh, come up and take a look at either the UFO and government book or the mind games. But beyond that, thank you so, so much for your attention and your presence. Thank you for encouraging me by being silent. <laughs> Thank you. Any, this is the information. If anyone wants to follow up, I'm always available. Well, not always, but available by email, uh, and on Twitter, and on Facebook, and on LinkedIn, the usual. Please. Q and A. If you ask, uh, good to ask sure, sure. ではあの質疑応答を受けていただけるということなので、質問あります方を挙手をお願いいたします。いかがでしょうか。えっと、壁際の一番向こうの方をお願いいたします。これ前から言った方が、はい、壁際の方です
Thank you for your talk, and I have one question. Uh, is there any recommendation book for understanding what you are talking about this session? Uh, yes, uh, always start with my books. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's definitely uh, yeah, I a place to go. Uh, this is the cover of uh, my new novel, Foam, is a trilogy, and volume three is Identity is Destiny, and that's a human before the majesty and mystery of the universe. It's a wonderful story, and it's full of fun, and it's very sexy, uh, which I hope gets around, and I want the book banned so that people will buy it. Uh, but where else to go? I do have a complete bibliography. I'm not, I'm not going to read it off, but I have a bibliography uh, that attends this, uh, this speech, and I will be glad to send it to anyone who requests it. It, it may be, I know you have a copy of it somewhere. Uh, it may be available through through Code Blue, but I'll be glad to send it to you. Uh, just take my email down, uh, our theme at themeworks.com, and uh, write to me and I'll, I'll send it to you. And also we can engage in a conversation because the question when someone says, what should I read, uh, the question that should come back is, what have you read? In other words, what is your context now? What are you thinking now? What is your frame now? What do you want to explore? How do you want to go about it? In other words, you do a little mentoring along the way. So, um, so if you want to engage in a conversation about that, what would be most useful to you and why, uh, please, we can do that too, by email or Skype or any of the other wonders of modern technology. Thank you so much. あ、では、こちらの真ん中、はい、壁際の方お願いいたします。あ、え、大変興味深い講演ありがとうございました。えっと、2年出問がありますえっと、あの、去年くらいにあの、CIA の方から、え、1956年代くらいにたくさん目
Uh, and he wrote this. It is the opinion that the phenomenon is real and not visionary or fictitious. These are objects approximately the size of a disk. The operating characteristics include extreme rates of climb, maneuverability, particularly in roll and action, which must be considered evasive when sighted by friendly aircraft and radar, all lend belief to the possibility that some objects are controlled either manually, automatically, or remotely. In other words, they knew that it was real. They knew from the outset that it was real because they had good, reliable reports from bona fide people. And the U-2 story, while some U-2 flights may have been mistaken, like many things are mistaken, we estimate, those of us who investigate the phenomenon, maybe 90% of the reports are based, especially today, on technologies which the public does not know. Stealth technology was not known for about 20 years about after it had been developed. The same with drones. Drones were often confused for UFOs. I have a friend who worked at Eglin Air Force Base who, when they learned that a particular person in Florida was saying there are UFOs all over, they knew they were testing drones, which no one knew it existed, and he said, ha, huh, they want to see UFOs? Let's show them UFOs. So they have fun with that but it doesn't account for the bottom line 10%. And that incident that I referred to in Washington, D.C. resulted in headlines like this. Uh, I want to use this just to make the point again that the media disseminated information in a particular way. These headlines, not only on that incident, we have thousands of clippings. Uh, Barry Greenwood, one of the authors of the book, has 250,000 clippings, which he has amassed. He's obsessive, but he's got them. And they include things like this, the front page of the Washington Post in July of 1952. Uh, they knew it was real, but the point I want to make with this is that newspapers like that, and like that, and like that, and like that, and like that, were reporting this phenomena as news. It was reported as news. And it was in 53, the year after this particular event, uh, that the the uh, process changed, which altered the way the media was going to be used. And we have the CIA document saying we need to get celebrities like Arthur Godfrey, Dave Garraway, later Walter Cronkite, and use those authoritative voices to disseminate the view of this phenomena that we want. At the same time, they did something else. Um, they made sure that this is the way it was reported. Space aliens drained my blood and filled my veins with a mysterious yellow fluid. Uh, and this comes from a guy, you can see his picture down there, big eyes. That would scare the hell out of anybody, right? I mean, I would be shaken. Uh, this is in the uh, National Enquirer. You may know or not know, the National Enquirer is a tabloid, a newspaper that publishes all kinds of uh, unreliable stories. Uh, the question that is seldom asked is, where did the National Enquirer come from? I mentioned all the influence that the intelligence agencies had on legitimate, bona fide, respectable media, but I haven't gone into the uh, vast literature of how they used material like this to disseminate a contrary view of how ridiculous it was to talk about space aliens. Uh, people don't ask, where did the National Enquirer come from? Uh, the fellow who started it, his name was Gene Pope, Generoso Pope, and he started it in 1953. Uh, a question which should be asked is, what was he doing in 1952? He was doing covert operations for the CIA. It's in his resume. He was doing propaganda and psychological warfare for the CIA. He decided to quit that job and start a newspaper like this. Did it make money? No. It didn't make money until the 1960s. For years, he had to be supported by infusions of cash in large numbers. Uh, how did it get to him? Cash came through the hands of the leading mafia chieftain in uh, New York, uh, who was his friend and ally. And that sustained the paper, which couldn't make it on its own. Uh, was Gene Pope, this disreputable publisher, connected politically? When he died, the eulogy was given by Melvin Laird, who was then Secretary of Defense. In other words, whether they began the inquiry, as I'm suggesting, or merely used it, the CIA, we have documented, creates all sorts of other kinds of periodicals, which are used for the purpose of discrediting certain kinds of information. So, what we have experienced, uh, like when I give talks on this book, which I've done around the United States, uh, somebody always comes who has their own report to make. 
who has not felt free to speak aloud. And we're convinced that the reports that we've gathered reflect uh, maybe 1% of the encounters or experiences that people have had with the phenomena. Now, I'm not defining what it is, but I, I, I hope that speaks to your question of how difficult it is to get the information about the phenomena, and that's why our book was recommended for university libraries. We were rigorous in our historical documentation, and it's a seamless, bulletproof narrative, because all the data is the words of the government themselves in how they developed procedures and carried them out. It wasn't a conspiracy. People call it a conspiracy, and therefore you become a conspiracy theorist, which is a way to ridicule and reject what you're saying. But it doesn't need to be a conspiracy for people to meet in a room, decide on a plan of action, come out of the room, and execute it. It's not a conspiracy. It's the way human beings do business. And we have documented a lot of how they chose to do business uh, until the time when they finally theoretically divested themselves of an interest in the subject. It's a very good subject for exploring critical thinking and the use of media for deception, for manipulation. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that every report is true. As I say, 90% of them are, are usually mistaken. There are hoaxes. There are all kinds of other things. And nobody is more skeptical than the best researchers in wanting to get rid of those reports. What we're left with is, for example, Werner uh, von Braun, the father of American rocketry, his, his mentor, Hermann Oberth, said in a speech in 1954 in Germany, he referred to the characteristics, operating characteristics of UFOs, and he said, if I only had one or two reports, I wouldn't say this, but I have more than 30, and they are based on the radar and human observations from US Navy and Air Force pilots. We have documents up the kazoo to testify to the fact that the phenomena was real and that all sorts of misrepresentations of it, both real and intended, both intended and unintended, uh, have followed through the years. But it's a good case study of how you have to strip away all, all of the extra added stuff. But it wasn't UFO, it wasn't U2 flights. U2s did not stop automobiles, you know, for example. Okay. That's it? All right, well, uh, I'm, I'm always around uh, one way or the other. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for being here, and thanks for listening. これにて貴重講演終了とさせていただきます。